Hello, I'm Getify, but most of you know me as Kyle Simpson, and I'm director of Web Futures for my own company, which means I get to spend my time envisioning the future of the web and empowering others to achieve that. To that end, I've also recently partnered with a company called Tab9. They make an AI-powered autocomplete plugin for your code editor, whichever one your favorite one is, that helps figure out what your code is doing and make better semantic suggestions based upon being trained on open source code out in the wild, as well as figuring out what you're doing in your own code base. It's a really exciting and opening up space, and I'm really looking forward to seeing more coming there. So keep an eye on tab nine, and you'll hear more from me about that in the future. Today we're going to talk about monads, and I know that's some really scary stuff. In the overall realm of functional programming, it definitely can be a bit scary. In addition to some other books that you may know that I've written, you probably haven't heard or don't know about the Functionalite JavaScript book. Now, Functionalite JavaScript is uh, all about functional programming, but it has an appendix in there about monads. So obviously, I think you should read the whole book, but especially check out that appendix if you want more information about what we're talking about today. So we only have a few minutes to, to speak here together, and the topic of monads is such a big and complex and kind of intimidating topic. So don't expect for this to be like a PhD dissertation or anything like that. We're just going to try to develop some ground-up intuition about how these things help us solve problems in our code. So don't worry if it feels like it's going too quick. This is to just get your feet wet, and then I hope that you'll look into some libraries and some other writings on the topic if you want to learn more. At this quote, some people have uh, purposed this quote in many different ways. You can fill in the blank with different things besides regular expressions. Uh, so we filled in the blank with, lot, with lots of different things before, but especially I think we hear this a lot with regular expressions. And to be honest with you, it's entirely fair that you may think that what I'm about to do today is the same thing. I'm suggesting that we have these problems in our programs, and when I suggest monads, that might feel like we're just creating more problems. But I do hope that you'll keep an open mind about it. Because the truth is that actually regular expressions have kind of gotten a bad rap. I mean, regular expressions have been used for lots of really important and useful tasks, and, and so I think they're really good, and actually all developers really should learn to use them in their programs. But let's be honest, what we've all heard or seen or maybe even attempted ourselves is to parse some arbitrary block of HTML text with a regular expression, and then we quickly realize what just a terrible idea that is. Uh, if you were parsing just a small piece of HTML that you knew the structure of it, a regular expression is perfectly reasonable. But if you're trying to parse any arbitrary text that might be formatted like HTML, well, then things just get completely out of hand. So you've probably heard this adage before about the right tool for the right job. But there's more to it than just the right tool because we also have to use the tool in the way that it was designed. So imagine if I, my task is to put a nail into the wall and I have a hammer in my hand, that's the right tool. And if I swing the hammer, it's going to work probably pretty well. I mean, I'm decent with a hammer. But if I were to stick that hammer in my mouth and try to swing it, it's not going to work, even though it's the right tool for the right job if it's not used in the right way. So what we're getting at here is that a task like parsing all arbitrary HTML is not the right task for regular expressions. It's not the right tool, and it's not the right usage of that tool. But for a very specific task, well, absolutely, that can be the right, the right tool for that job. So really, it's the question of specialized tasks versus generalized tasks. And, and I would argue the same is true of monads, as I'm saying here about regular expressions. Now, I love this quote. Because what really stands out to me about this quote is the yet part. It's that we, we have to embrace the idea that all of technology, and as we're talking today about software, that software is an ever-evolving process, that it's just a moment in time. So what you're seeing in this talk today is actually just a moment in time of my journey to learn functional programming and to learn monads, and that doesn't represent the end. It's not the beginning. It's not the end. It's somewhere in the middle. We're all in progress, and so all software is kind of like that as well. It's not a finished working product, but we're on the way to it, and that's why I want to share these thoughts today. So let's take a look at monads. Let's start to break down this topic a little bit. And how might we want to define or explain monads? Well, a typical functional programmer might 
cite some of this kind of Haskell type theory notation stuff, which literally is Greek to me. I don't understand what many of those symbols mean, and so that doesn't really do a lot for me. Uh, You may have also heard them referred to as burritos or onions or other sorts of silly metaphors, but I want to share with you the one that I prefer the most. Because I like to think of a monad, as I do other things in programming, as like a Rubik's Cube, meaning that there are different sides to it. And we can look at one side and understand one aspect of it without having to completely understand the entire cube. And that's sort of what we're going to do today is look at one side of how monads are to develop some intuition from the ground up about things we already do in our programs and how we want to use monads to solve those maybe in better ways. But that's not the same thing as completely fully understanding everything there is to know about a monad. But to answer that really important question that I know is all in the back of your minds, but, but what is a monad? Well, let me just define it this way. It's a set of rules for how one collection of uh, one or more values and behaviors can interact with another collection of values or behaviors. And if you sort of squinted at that, you might call that a data structure. Now, I know that's a bad word, especially because there's a lot of connotation to data structure from the object-oriented world. For example, we think about data structures as data and behavior, but we think about the methods as modifying that state. And in a monad, it's going to hold on to whatever information it has, and that's not ever going to change. We might produce a new thing out of it. So it's a little bit like maybe an immutable data structure, but even that's not exactly correct. So I do understand why sometimes people ruffle a little bit at this idea of calling it a data structure, but I think in terms of developing some intuition, I think that's an okay place to start, to think about it as that's what we do in our programs when we have this value and we want to give it some specific behavior, we wrap it up and we can do that with a a data structure, a formal class in object-oriented programming, but we can do it with monads when we're approaching functional programming. So ultimately, I find this what question a bit of a distraction, to be completely honest. Yes, there's a lot of formality behind it, but what I really want us to focus our attention on is actually the why. I want us to ask why monads more than just what monads. I think that is a more important question. So you all have probably heard this quote before or have seen it uh, quoted in some place. If you've ever been to another Monad talk, there's at least a decent chance that this has been quoted at some point. As a matter of fact, I used to use this phrase. I used to quote this as sort of a way to kind of p- push back on or critique the functional programming space because you can hear these things cited and they're using all these kind of strange words like monad and monoid and category and endofunctor. What are all these weird words? And, and, and the, the word just there kind of implies that it should be self-obvious. Now, the, the true etymology of this phrase was actually used as a joke, but it's been misused and misapplied and, and actually creates a little bit of a divisive nature where if, if that statement is not obvious to you, then you probably feel like, oh, I'm, I guess I'm not smart enough, I'm not qualified enough to learn these things. And that was absolutely the case for me, that the times that I heard decided over the years when I was trying to learn, this had nothing but putting me off, it pushed me off. And so I just, I want to actually share in the spirit of that, like we're in a journey where this used to be just a confusing jumble of words. I just want to quickly give you a glimpse that as I've learned more about this monad space, these words are not completely meaningless and abstract. They do have actual concrete meanings. That doesn't mean that I think you need to learn the terms to be able to understand and use monads. But once you get to know monads better, you will begin to run across these words more often. So let me give you an example. The, mono, the monoid, we're defining monad in, types of these, in terms of these other words. And the monoid, what is a monoid? Well, it's an associative concat. And I know that's like defining that w- weird word with maybe some other things. Um, and another way of saying it is it's a semi-group or a concatable. Uh, but it's, it's that idea plus an empty value. And, and though that's going to seem a little bit confusing and strange to you, let me just break it down with an example. An example, for example, strings. We know how strings work, and we know that strings can be concatted together. And we know that there's also an empty string that if you concat that to any string, it doesn't change the string. So you might have some intuition about how strings concatenate and how that works, and that there's some associativity involved in the, in the way that we group the concatenation of multiple strings. And actually, that's just an example of the formality that we're talking about with monoid. 
Okay, so there's a formal word for something that you might already have a bit of intuition about. Functor, for example. Functor is a value or a set of values that can be mapped over, and it results in a new value or a collection of values of that same type. So, for example, an array. We know arrays are like a list of numbers or a list of strings or any other values, and we know that we have the map method on arrays, and so we can call map and we get back a new array. Well, actually, that's an example of functor. Okay? Now, Endo, of course, is this forest moon in the Star Wars galaxy. <laughs> I'm kidding. That's Endor. Endo, which actually is, it kind of comes from words like we've, you may have heard of endoscopy, which is like internal surgery through like little microscopic tubes and stuff like that. As a prefix, Endo just means within. And as it's applied here in this space, it really means that a functor is going to map its values back to the same category as it started with which is actually all we're already true of all the monads that we use in functional programming. So if we break these scary words down, it turns out that there's some intuition here that's not too bad, it's not too difficult. And as you run across these things more, I don't want you to be scared by these terms the way that I used to be. Now, I just used a bunch of big words and a bunch of confusing kind of stuff. Did you know that there were even such a thing as multiple algebras? Because that was strange and weird to me. This is like Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore sort of stuff. But instead of being direct, distracted by that whole what stuff, all the formality of that, I, I just presented it because I don't want you to be scared by it. But instead of being distracted by, oh, I don't know these words or I don't know all of these ideas, I want us to focus on that why part. And that's what this talk is going to focus on. What can we do with these things in our code, and why will that matter? Now, I have to say one more word about the space that I'm entering into, because by diving into this talk, I know that people are going to come out of the woodwork and say, oh, well, actually, because there's probably going to be something that I'm not exactly formal or exactly specific or, or correct on, and so there's going to be a lot of temptation to do that, and, and especially in the functional programming space, there's this idea that there's kind of only one way to describe something. It's, it's sort of like the functional programming police don't want you to explain anything unless you do it in the one right way. Way. And I just reject the notion that there's only one right way to explain monads. I think there's lots of different ways. There's lots of different sides to that Rubik's Cube. So the way that I'm going to break this down to try to move from that formality back to some informality and some intuition is to take a bunch of really complex topics and boil them down into two specific buckets. We'll call those buckets types and values. So what are we talking about with types and values? Well, we could say that types are the behaviors that we can expect. For example, if you have a number type, that tells us that things that are numbers, we can do math on them. But that's very abstract, that's not concrete, we can't do anything with that. So you would need a concrete number value to be able to use it to do math, like the number 42, we need it as an actual thing to do math on. So in JavaScript land, we could see that types and values are really kind of blurred. They're sort of mixed together. You can be more formal about it, and it's not to say that there aren't types versus values, but in JavaScript, we do end up kind of mixing these things together, and I think that's okay. I don't think that we have to be super formal, like, oh, well, that's only the type thing or that's only a value thing. So as we go throughout this, I'll identify type versus value, but understand that there's quite a bit of bleed over in the way that we're presenting it. So what does, the, what does a monad mean? What does that word mean? Th th it goes back to the, like the type versus a. So we want to ask the question, are we talking about the monad, which is kind of like a type-based description, versus a monad, which is a concrete value in our programs that we could do something with? And one way of defining the monad is through the formalism of the three laws. And if you've done any reading about monads, you've probably heard of these three laws. But then we have a monad, which as I said before, is kind of like a data structure that we can actually do something with in our programs. So a monad will actually have a method on it, like chain or bind, but the monad, the laws, they describe what those kinds of things need to be able to do. They're not going to say it has to have a chain method, but they're going to say it has to be able to do the following things. So we're describing it in the more abstract sense with the type, or we're actually dealing concretely with something in a program that we can compute values with. Oh, and by the way, with our values, especially in JavaScript, we can kind of mix these things together and we can augment the behaviors and we can get new and more powerful kinds of monads like the maybe and the either, the IO, the reader, and we'll talk about many of these as we go through the rest of the talk.
So I think we need to see some code because it's been almost 15 minutes of me talking very abstractly about the topic. So I'm going to present to you this code, which is using a Monad library that I wrote. Now, I'm not showing you this library because it's like a sales job. Like, I want you to use this library. It's called Manio. Uh, but I wanted to have something concrete, some actual code that we could look at and evaluate. And from this talk, if you're curious to play around with Monads, you might grab Manio and play around with it. There are many other Monad libraries out there, but I found them to be hard to get started with because they sort of focus more on the formalism. For example, there are these Monad libraries in what we call the fantasy land kind of uh, space where, where things are all kind of agreeing a certain way to work, but there's a lot of formalism around that. And when you try to read through some of the documentation there, I found it to be very difficult, a bit intimidating. So, with Monio, it's trying to lead with something a little bit more intuitive the way we might try to do something in our JavaScript programs more naturally. So what you see here is that we see just on line one. Just is really a actual function that we can call. You can see that I can pass in the number three into just and I can get back another thing, right? I can get back this thing which is a which is an actual A monad, it's a monad instance. And I can call inspect on that thing and we see that it's a just wrapped around the value three. And then I can even ask about some value and say, is this thing a just? A quick call out is that the just monad that I've presented here, typically you don't see that as its own standalone monad. In most other libraries, you won't find a thing called just. You'll find that as part of a bigger monad, which is called maybe, that we're gonna look at in just a moment. But with Monio, I found it to be kind of more, uh, easier to explain and easier to kind of, it's more convenient if we just expose it directly as a monad that you can create. It's sort of serving the purpose of the identity monad here. It's just holding on to a value, but it's making that value be monadic in its behavior, which makes it easier to interact with the other monads. All right, so we talked about that type uh, idea, and let's just dive into that, but illustrate it with some concrete code, the type or the interface. As I said, it doesn't require a chain method, but the implementation in Monio does provide that behavior by way of a method called chain. So we can call a dot chain on it instead of, uh, for example, calling it bind or flat map. And there are aliases to those, by the way, but we chose to go with chain. That's my preferred method name for that. It's the underlying behavior that the laws require. And so what you see here is a representation of those laws being proved for one specific value and for one specific kind of monad. That's not like proving all monads or all, you know, all implementations of the law, but it does illustrate the ideas behind the laws and show that if we have something in code, we can prove to ourselves that we have a lawful implementation of a monad. And that's really what this code is doing. It illustrates these monad law derived behaviors for one specific monad, the just, and for one specific value, which is three. So what are these other behaviors that I've kind of referred to? Well, we can actually mix these things together. And so I like to refer to this as monads and friends. It's kind of my umbrella term for it because we have monads and we have these other things that aren't strictly monads, but I often pair them together. I see them most useful when paired together. So I already mentioned the semi-group or the concatenable, but there's also foldable and applicative and some of these others in the space. And category theory tells us that these exist completely independently. But, I, as I said, in practice, I often see them most useful when they are mixed together. So I'm going to kind of lump them together informally under this umbrella term of monads and friends. And that's how we're going to go about our exploration today, is looking at how we work with monads and their friends to get problems solved in our programs. So let's just take a quick example. Um, foldable is one of the behaviors that we can... Um, associate or kind of mix in with our monads. It's not strictly a monad behavior, but it's something that we can mix in. And, and so I'm going to show you a usage of a monad I've already referred to, which is called the maybe monad. And we're actually going to come back and look more at maybe in just a little bit, but this is just a quick glimpse of how maybe works. And I want to call out that this fold method that we have here, that is the foldable behavior added into or mixed into our maybe implementation in the Manio library. So what it's doing here actually is it's saying, 
Inside of this maybe, I either have an actual affirmative value or I basically have an emptiness. And it's one of the two. And the fold method says, if I have one or the other of these things, pick whichever one it is and invoke one of the functions, either from line five or from line six, invoke one of those functions depending upon what kind of value I have. If I have no value at all, like it's the empty value, then invoke the function from line five, which as you see is sort of providing a default fallback here, that dash dash. But if I have a real actual value held inside of my maybe monad, then the fold method will invoke the second one, the one from line six, in which case you can see that I'm actually formatting that currency to look like US currency. So the maybe is allowing us to hold on to a value and then the foldable allows us to make a decision on that value, whether we want to kind of fall back to a default or do some other operations. So there's our monads and friends. They're working together. They're playing well in the sandbox, if you will. So we're going to come back to maybe in just a moment. I just wanted to kind of put that little example out there so it didn't feel quite so abstract, okay? So I have mentioned this a couple of times, and I want to give you a more straightforward answer. Why monads? And I'm going to say that the answer that I think best to that is because they are a tool, just like regular expressions, that if you have a problem and if you find the right tool and the right way to use that tool, you can more effectively solve the problem. There's lots of things that you can do with a hammer. Not all of them are the right thing to do with a hammer. And there's one right way or a couple of right ways to use a hammer and a bunch of ways you could use it incorrectly. So they hap these monads, they happen to model and solve problems a bit differently than we're used to. And that's going to look very unfamiliar to us and that's going to feel scary and feel less readable. But I, I just want to say that if you use these things incorrectly, you absolutely will go off, you know, off the rails, but if you use them correctly, in the same way that if you use regular expressions correctly, they can be a very powerful tool that unlocks even more capabilities in our programs. And monads are definitely that way. If we use them correctly, they really do unlock a lot of power in our programs. So they can be very helpful if we use them correctly. Okay, so what problems might we face in our programs? Like, what kind of questions might we ask? We could say, how could I, for example, choose a value or a fallback? Or how could I gracefully handle an exception? Or how could I handle these side effects that happen in my program? These are all things that you already handle in all of your programs. And you already, that means you already have solutions to them, which is completely okay. All right? I'm, I'm not saying that any of the existing solutions that you have are insufficient. You have shipped great applications with solutions to these that you've never used monads before. But you might not have ever stopped to wonder, is there a better way of solving that same problem? We know that every problem could probably be solved a hundred different ways, but is there a better way to solve that problem? And what I want us to get a glimpse of is, how might we do it if we were going to use monads? Now, beware that these particular solutions are going to look very different and much less familiar. And as our instinct always is, when something looks less familiar, we immediately jump to the conclusion that thing is less readable, I could never understand it, I could never use it, and more importantly, nobody else on my team would ever accept that kind of code. And the, the problem that we have here is that familiarity is the most key ingredient to readability. And so the catch-22 is if you don't ever push your envelope and try new things, you'll never get more familiar with them and they'll never be more readable. The same was true when you were on some older JavaScript framework and then you decided to switch to React. The first few days, it looked very, very different to you. And it was probably a lot less readable. And then over time, you got more familiar with it and now it's probably very readable. Or, you know, substitute view or Angular or whatever your favorite framework might be. So what I'm suggesting here is that the tension, the catch-22, is that you do kind of have to push that envelope a little bit. You do have to work on these things. You can't just assume that you will always immediately glance at it and understand what it's doing. Uh, and by the way, tasks one and two here, they illustrate the, we're going to use them with the maybe and the either monads respectively, but actually they're sort of interchangeable. 
And that's going to be kind of an interesting thing. We're going to use maybe for task one, but you could actually do maybe for task two, and we'll use either for two, but you could do that with task one. It's kind of an interesting characteristic of these that sometimes we can swap in a different tool and still get the job done once we learn the in insides, the ins and outs of how these things work. Oh, and I also want to call out that this is just three, right? Because I only have a few minutes more to speak with you. There's lots and lots of other problems that we solve, and monads can solve many, many of those other problems. So I don't mean for this to be like an exhaustive list. It was just kind of like the three quick ones that I thought I could illustrate best for us. All right, so I want us to jump in. Let's look at that first one, choosing a value or a fallback. Now, I want you to look here at this, um, this uh, implementation. I'm, I'm using the maybe, as I, as I said. And I want you to look here on that first line. You see maybe.from, okay? Maybe.from is taking some value, and it's putting it into a maybe, and it's making a decision. It may not seem obvious to you, but it's making a decision. Is this value present and available, or is it one of those like empty values like null or undefined? So when we get a maybe value, we've made a decision of representing it as a maybe just, as you can see there on line three, or representing it as a maybe nothing, which is what we're illustrating on line six. On line six, we do the maybe dot from with null, and then we end up with this maybe nothing value, okay? The, the maybe function that we see on line eight is the unit constructor. It's not the same thing as maybe dot from, and that's a little subtle difference, but the unit constructor is just going to wrap a maybe around whatever you give it, like a maybe just around whatever you give it. It's not going to make the decisions that is it empty or not. The maybe dot from helper utility is the thing that's making those decisions. And the only reason I call that out is if you Google implementations of monads, you're going to find a bunch of examples of people making monads, writing blog posts about monads, and they almost always do maybe, and they almost always do this illustration of maybe where they take the unit constructor and they put that logic of deciding uh, undefined or not into that unit constructor, and that's actually a no-no because it turns out that it makes the unit constructor invalid according to the, law, the laws of monads. They sort of cheat because it's a little bit more convenient. And so I, I, I just want to show you that we are calling out very specifically that, that our helper utility maybe dot from is where that selection logic can happen. So an example from some real code. This is an application that I've actually been working on, and I wanted to give us an example of some real code that I was writing, and I was doing it in a very imperative, non-functional, non-monadic way. And, I, and then I got to thinking, well, this would be a good way of trying to illustrate kind of side by side how we might do something monadically. So you see here that I'm, I'm basically doing a regular expression match. There's our good friend regular expression again. I'm doing a regular expression match against these mime types that come from like a drop down in the app. And what I'm basically pulling out is if it matches this video, audio, or image, then I want to use it. And if it doesn't match, then it's going to end up basically just defaulting to this web value. So that's what you see here is that we're doing a destructuring assignment against the match value. We're doing that not equals null check. That's the important thing there. That not equals null check is, is what we're, we're deciding. Do I have a real value or do I need to substitute this backup value like quote web? Okay. And you probably recognize code like this. You maybe didn't use ternaries, maybe you did if statements, but you've probably done logic like this in your programs where you've needed to select one value or select another fallback value. So that's all I'm doing here. And it's just three or four short lines of code, so it's not that complex. But I wanted to take this as an opportunity to illustrate how we might do it with monads. So here's what we're going to do, the same exact outcome, but we're going to do it with monads. And the way we're going to do it, is again, we still do the regular expression on line two, but on line three, we're going to throw that value that we got into the maybe by, by way of that utility, that maybe dot from, because that's where that little not equals null check is going to happen inside of there. And then we're going to call our good friend fold. That's the foldable behavior that's mixed in with maybe. Fold is going to allow us to make a decision, basically. Do I have one of those maybe empties, in which case I want to fall back to the web? Otherwise, I have a maybe just around some specific match value, and then I just want to grab it out. And here you see I just kind of do the no op with the identity function. Just takes, it re returns back whatever it took in. So the fold along with that maybe dot from is doing that selection logic that we did imperatively with the ternary in the previous. And again, this is a little bit more verbose and certainly less familiar to you. So your instinct might be, oh, this is, not le this is less readable. I don't want to do it. And you maybe ready to tune me out. 
But uh, what I hope that you'll hear from me is that actually there's a lot more power in representing this solution through monads. It unlocks all of these other capabilities, which are not super obvious in this one little kind of uh, isolated example. So as we go along, I hope that you're just getting an intuition that you can solve problems this way, that it's not completely outlandish, but it's okay if it still feels less familiar that's kind of the point. It is going to be less familiar, but it's going to push the envelope forward in our programs. We're going to evolve and be able to write better software as a result. Okay, so one last example, uh, maybe not actually last example, but another example that's maybe a little bit more in depth for this maybe monad. We're still doing that same not equals null check, but what I wanted to do here was also be able to, to um, do a little bit of logic after the selection check. So as you see there on line four, I'm doing that substring kind of uh, uh, mapping on top of this value. I'm changing the value by truncating it with a dot, dot, dot ellipsis if it's too long. So I checked first to see if I have the value. That's what happens on line two, if it's a non-empty value. And then I check to see if it's short and you know, too long. And then if it is too long, then I truncate it. And then we're going to do the exact same thing, but we're going to do it with a maybe. So again, you see that our, our friend maybe.from, and then we call dot .map after that monad. So this is the functor nature of our monads coming into play. If you remember that functor was a thing that can be mapped over, so we have a dot .map method on our monad, and the dot .map method has this interesting characteristic to it that for a, for a, a monad that could have these kind of these no-ops, like these empty values, then map is basically not gonna do anything in the nothing case. It's a no-op, it's just gonna skip over it, it's short-circuiting. It's a little bit like how promises, you know, have promise dot then over and over again. If you get an exception in a promise, it's just gonna skip right over all of the other items in our promise chain. It's, it's sort of the same thing. So the map call here is safe. It'll only run in the case of our, our monad having a real value that we've matched, uh, that we've gotten um, for this description, but it won't run in the case where we didn't have anything, which is why we can then do, still call our fold call. And we didn't do our processing, our kind of string concatenate, uh, um, shrinking or you know the ellipsis. Or, we didn't do that logic in the case of the empty missing value. We just kind of skipped over the map call and went right to the fold call. So one last example of using the maybe, and this is a bit different, but it's actually more common for maybe to be illustrated in this way. If you've seen the relatively recent JavaScript feature, which is that question mark or the optional chaining operator as it's referred to, and it kind of allows us to safely access properties in objects. Well, if you were doing, like you see here on line nine, we're doing the question mark dot and question mark dot. Well, that's safe in case of one of those properties being missing. Like you see on line 12, we, we don't have a thumbnail. And so, of course, that would fail, but it doesn't fail. It just kind of gracefully falls back to undefined. It short circuits out to the undefined value. So a lot of people are really excited about this kind of you know, property access where we don't have to do all the if-then checks, which you're probably familiar with. But I just wanted to show you that in addition to doing this with nice new syntax, this is a perfect example of a, a very common example of illustrating the maybe monad. So how would we do this if we were gonna do it with maybe? Well, what we do is we, we have that same entry value, but you notice that I'm gonna throw it into the maybe with a maybe.from, I'm gonna throw our entry in there, and then I'm gonna do these chain methods. You remember that chain is a method that the monad laws require the capability of. They don't necessarily require it to be called chain, but we have to have that capability available to us. Since it's a monad, we can just call chain on it and go to the next one. And, and chain has that same short-circuiting behavior that we saw in the previous slide with map. If at any point along the way, we fail to find that property, if that property access that we're doing, we have our property function that I've kind of put there in comments on line nine, that prop function is doing maybe.from, and if that ends up with a maybe nothing because the property was not there, well then all the rest of those chain calls are skipped over because they're no ops, and then we just fall to that last one, which is the inspect. So that's why the first time, line 15, we see the maybe just with our URL in it, but then on line 22, we see just the maybe nothing, okay? So that's another example. And again, that's more verbose, of course, but the power of having our, may our, our values and our behaviors modeled as monads really begins, uh, begins to be unlocked when we start putting more and more monads together. Because if you think about the maybe nothing that we see on line 22, that is not at all the same thing as the undefined value that we see on line 13. 
They may seem like they're kind of one and the same or that the maybe nothing is a lot of circumstance but not actually any benefit because the maybe nothing feels like a really like do nothing kind of monad. But actually the maybe nothing is a lot more useful than just an undefined value. We have to put a lot of caveat checks around an undefined value that passes through our program. But if we have a maybe nothing and we pass it around all our other monads, because of the way monads interact with each other, it'll safely interact in all the no-op ways that we expect. So we don't have to write all of that special case, condition, if statement kind of stuff. All right, we said task two was how could we gracefully handle exceptions. And here I'm going to introduce the either monad. The either mode in is a bit like maybe. They're both kind of what we would refer to as a sum type, meaning that they're kind of keeping multiple values, in this case, two values together. Um, and and, and on, in the either, in, in the maybe, we called it just and nothing. Remember, maybe was a pairing of just or nothing, depending on the kind of emptiness of what value we put into it. But with the either, it, we call it left and right. And typically, the either monad is reserved or it is often used to handle exceptions. Somewhere in our code, something happens, and we need to kind of gracefully fall out of that exception handling, but we need to hold on to what happens because maybe we need to report that to a log or maybe we need to edit it to, we need whatever that value is to be able to gracefully recover from it. And so the either monad is actually allowing us um, to model the exception message, we typically would reserve the left side of the either for the exception message, and the right side as whatever's next, you can just keep going. So it's going to have that same sort of short-circuiting behavior, not that much unlike a try-catch. A try-catch would sort of, we could list several operations in a try block, and whenever the first exception happens, it exits out and goes immediately to the catch. It's kind of the same thing. If you model a bunch of operations as chained onto an either, at any point if one of those fails with an exception, well then it just sort of you know, bows out or short circuits out to the either left value, and then it goes all the way down to the end. It doesn't, any of the map calls or chains that you do on it will just be no ops. So very similar to maybe in that respect. All right, so the left side um, might hold uh, an exception, and we said try catches are kind of an example of that. So here's an example in my code base where I needed to parse some JSON and then save that to a database, right? Very straightforward. I have parsing of J J JSON on, the, on line two, and then line three we're saving to the database. And you've probably written code like this before. And try catches work just fine, but usually for like one level. If you have like multiple levels deep, it gets really complex. And that's where maybe something like the either monad might start to shine. So let's do this exact same example, but let's do it with the either monad. We're going to define this little helper function that we call safe here. And the safe is going to try to do some operation, and it's going to throw the success of that operation into an either right, as you see there on line three, or on line four, if it fails, it's going to throw that error message into an either left. So when we call this parse function, we've defined parse line six in terms of our safe. That's a safe wrapper around JSON parse. And on line eight, when we call parse, we are, we are going to get back an either that will either be an either left or an either right. If it's an either left, it's just going to skip those next operations, so we won't do the chain, and we'll skip right to the fold. If it's an either right, then we will do the chain, which case we do the safe wrapper around our save to DB function. And then if that succeeds, then we end up with an either right, which on line um, 12 here will just fall into the identity function. If either of those two steps failed, we end up with an either left, and then we fall into the line 11 side of the fold, which just allows, in this case, it just alerts our error message, okay? So we see our friend foldable coming back. Similar to how we did it with maybes, we see foldable on our either monad, and that allows us to kind of short circuit out there as well. All right, our third task was the IO monad. Uh, we're going to use the IO monad to manage our IO, our side effects. We have this IO monad that is a bit different from the other ones, but it's more powerful. Where the other ones were holding on to things like numbers or strings or whatever, the IO monad basically holds on to a function. And it tr because functions are first class citizens, that's a value just like the number 42 is. But because it's holding on to that function, it essentially treats the behavior inside of that function, 
which would typically be side effects, things like our console log statement, for example. That's a side effect. It would treat those side effects as lazy, meaning they don't happen right now. They happen whenever we tell the whole I.O. to happen, which actually happens at the run call. So you see line three, a dot run call will trigger the whole chain of I.O. operations. But as we chain everything together, none of it is actually happening. It's all just kind of lazily piling its way up. And then we have this whole string of side effecting operations that will occur only when we invoke that run method. So in this example here, I've got like a hello to console the hello message, and I've got a world IO that will console log the world message, and then you'll notice lines eight and nine, I chain those together. I can do that because IO is a monad, and we know that monads are going to give us, in, in this implementation, a chain method. So I can take the hello monad and chain it to the world monad, and then I have this composed IO monad that expresses two different side effects the console message of hello and the console message of world both being side effects. And, you know, side effects are anything, whether it's console messages or DOM operations, binding event handlers, making AJAX calls, setting timeouts, anything asynchronous, all of that, it's all side effects. So IO actually becomes really powerful because we can model pretty much all those operations with, an, with a properly and powerfully implemented IO monad. And so more on that in just a moment. But you can see that I've composed the two together, lines um, 8 and 9. And then on line 10, that's when I invoke it. So I can call dot run. Now I'm doing it immediately here, but I don't have to do it immediately. I could express the composition of these two side effects, which seems a little strange. We wouldn't normally think of being able to compose two side effects since composition generally only works with pure non-side effecting things. The power of the IO monad here is that I've composed two actual side effects together. And, and that's still okay because none of it's happened because it's lazy. And then later I could decide that I want to take that monad and either combine it with some other monad or actually invoke it with the dot run call. And IO is going to ensure that we have a nice predictable sequencing of all these side effects. And even if they're asynchronous, everything will compose the way that we expect. So we can manage side effects in our programs. Absolutely, we can manage side effects in our programs. And many of you have done that before. Um, for example, here's another, here's another piece of code from that app that I was talking about. Here I've got these functions first and second on line 6 and 10, and those are actually creating side effects because they're pulling something off an array. They're modifying that global array to pull off the first element and then the next element off of that array. And I can manage those side effects manually in this playlist function. Line 15 I can take and 16, I can take those two things and put them together, and I can make sure they happen in a specific order. And so you've probably written code exactly like like that playlist function many, many, many times. And you're managing your side effects very straightforwardly. But as soon as you start to compose that with some other side effects and compose those into bigger and bigger side effects, things do start to get hairy as soon as we have side effects all over the place. So one of the benefits, one of the values of being able to use the IO monad is that we can compose all of these sort of IO operations together, all these side effect operations together. So let's look at the exact same example, but let's do it with the IO monad. You'll notice I still have my entries uh, array, and I'm still doing first and second, but lines 8 and 9, I have first and second modeled as IO operations. And then line 10, I start to set up my playlist function, but I'm going to set it up as a monad, an IO monad, rather than a regular function. And I'm going to define that the operations are first concatted with a comma in between concatted with second. There's concat again. Remember, concat was our uh, semigroup from before. So we, we have our semigroup being repeated here. We have concatable, that behavior kind of helping. It's one of those friends that's come along with the monad to help us. And concat is going to basically allow an underlying value, if it's able to be concatted, it's going to essentially kind of de defer to that to, uh, to allow it to happen. So it's going to basically, or, you know, delegate down. So we know that strings can be compatted, concatted, and that's exactly what's happening here, is that these, these three three strings in these three different IO monads are all being concatted together by virtue of that concat method that's happening there. And then all of that is the monad, and then at some time, whenever we want to, we can call playlist.run, and all of those operations happen in a nice predictable order. And that, or we could take that IO monad uh, called playlist here, and we could compose that with some other IO monad or some other monad entirely to decide what we want to do in our programs. Okay? So again, because IO is lazy, none of that happened until the run call, and that's why it gives us some more predictability. Only we decide when we invoke the run function that we want our operations to start creating our side effects. 
Uh, let's give a little bit more uh, glimpse specifically into Manio's implementation of IO. Again, not as a sales pitch here, but I want to give you some understanding of how Manio tries, because it, it, the, the main idea behind Manio was to have a really powerful kind of Uber uh, IO monad that could do everything with all these helpers kind of all mixed in with it. And so the, one of the things that I really wanted was I wanted to bridge the gap between the really strictly functional world where everything is a chain and everything's kind of composed through chaining and things. That's an unfamiliar style to us. I wanted to bridge that with a style of coding that we're a little bit more familiar with. For example, the kind of async await syntax. And that's exactly what you see here. By way of this generator, we have what in the Haskell world they call do syntax, but the implementation here in JavaScript uses a generator. And we're using generator, so we use the yield instead of the await. But under the covers, it's basically doing what we expect an await to do. It's kind of unwrapping this thing. Here, the yield keyword is chaining our IOs together. And so we get this syntax that looks a lot more familiar to us inside of a generator here. It looks a lot more like the async await style that we're used to, and we can kind of reduce some of the mental overhead of trying to switch styles into the entirely kind of functional chaining aspect that we might be uh, expecting. So I just wanted to call out that, that Manio's IO supports that do style syntax with generators. Some libraries do, some libraries don't, but this was kind of the one of the main motivating factors behind Manio. Oh, and by the way, there are lots of other things that the IO monad can do in Monio. And I don't have time to get into all of this, but this is a quick little example. And there's a link here to, this is a demo off of the Monio repo if you want to go and see this. But I just wanted to quickly call this out because you'll see that that looks exactly like async await syntax. It we're, we're doing Ajax calls, which you would almost certainly have done in an async await function. We're using the yield keyword here instead of the await keyword. But under the covers, we're doing the exact same thing, which is that we're chaining these asynchronous IO together. So the thing I want to call out for you is that Manio's IO does something kind of special that most other IOs don't, which is that it's a transparent transformer over native JavaScript promises, which means we can do both synchronous IO operations and asynchronous ones all together in the same chain or inside the same do block, the same generator. It'll all work exactly the same whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. Because I wanted this to be more ergonomic the way we would typically do with our asynchronous programming. Okay, and so here's an example of that. Here's another example in our uh, in that same demo where I'm pulling, uh, you know, I'm doing more. I have this do syntax. We have a generator here, and I'm doing this yield cache dot get that you see, and then I'm doing a yield nums nums dot fold. Well, what is nums? Nums is a maybe, and here we're doing a fold. So now I'm mixing a maybe together with an io monad. And I'm, I'm doing so inside of that do style syntax. So we have the ability to bring in all of our monads together in one. The IO monad is also a reader, and that's, uh, that allows us to hold on to uh, an environment, uh, like a side effect environment as we carry through our operations. So there's a whole lot more involved. But the takeaway here is that that's kind of your one-stop shop. If you want to start playing with monads, you might want to look at Manio's IO plus the other helper monads. All right, so that was a whole bunch to throw at you. I know that you're probably like, your mind is kind of swimming, but just as a quick summary, we had the, the monad type interface, which describes kind of what things ought to be able to do. But it's really the focus that we've had for the whole second half of our discussion today is the specific implementation, a concrete value in our code, monad values, uh, the a monad versus the monad, a monad value in our program that we can do something with. And by the way, this is not an all or nothing proposition, this idea of using monads. What I'm trying to do is show that we can actually little by little incrementally improve our code base with functional principles and with monads. You don't have to re rewrite the whole thing using monads. You can write just a little piece of it at a time and progressively grow. So I hope that maybe you'll give monads a try after I've excited you from this talk and check out Manio if that's useful. Oh, and by the way, while you're at it, you should probably also pick up some regular expressions. Thanks very much for listening to this talk, and I'll see you around the internet.